Hello, folks. I'm Josh McGee, and welcome to another edition of the Gateway to Soccer Show. Thank you so much for tuning in to this international break version of the show. While there may not be much club soccer going on right now, there's still plenty of action to get to. I'm going to recap all of the big matches from this past weekend in club soccer. I'm going to look at the prominent international fixtures, some of which have already happened, and what to look out for here in the coming days, and also big STL soccer news that I'm going to get to a little bit later on in the show, and I'll have a great local guest to help round out this episode. As you can see, I'm repping USA Soccer quite a bit here. Obviously, the U.S. men's national team is back in action, but this is mainly for our veterans and for Veterans Day this week. Uh, again, shout out to all of our veterans. Thank you to all of the men and women who are currently serving here and abroad. I'm also repping my high school, Brentwood High School here. This is my training top from my senior year in high school. I just need a little something, a little hometown spirit to help get me through the week. As for my opening monologue, I'd like to open it with a tribute to the late great Alex Trebek by taking problems in the EPL for 500. This technology has had a hand in a lot of important matches this season and has been a lightning rod since its induction into the EPL. The answer, of course, is what is VAR? The latest VAR controversy came in the Crystal Palace versus Leeds United match this past weekend in the EPL. Crystal Palace went up early 1-0, but Leeds thought they had equalized through Patrick Bamford a few minutes later. However, VAR reviewed the goal and what looked to be an innocent way of Bamford signaling to his teammate where he wanted the ball played, actually VAR ruled it out for offsides. Palace would go on to score a few minutes later to make it 2-0, but would eventually win the match 4-1. This, of course, is coming off the back of the decision from a few weeks ago in the Liverpool-Everton match, the Merseyside Derby, where Liverpool thought they had the game-winning goal late on in that match, but when they went back and looked at it, VAR found that Sadio Mane's arm was offsides and disallowed the goal. So, of course, this actually comes down to the implementation of the new handball rule, which actually judges the area between the shoulder and the elbow as the bottom of the armpit and actually can't be called for handball. But because that's the case, that area is defined as you can't have it for a handball, then it can be used to score goals, in which case then it can be flagged for offsides. So that's what happened on these two plays and what's actually happened on a couple of plays where they really used those lines, those Star Trek type lines to really dissect and find those areas for which players were off sides. So of course, that doesn't really make any sense, right? That area of the arm has never been used to score goals. Players wouldn't think to be using for that. And again, something as innocent as Bamford signaling to his teammate where he wants the ball to be played now is being flagged off sides and cost him a goal when it's something that every striker does and will continue to do. And of course, what doesn't help with the VAR rule is, of course, that language, clear and obvious errors or serious missed instance. When you use phrases like that, it really confuses fans who look at these plays and say, well, it wasn't clear and obvious that this person was offsides, that you have to go back, take five minutes, use these made up lines, which of course, how can we know if they're official? It's kind of like the NFL, right? Where they have that first down marker. The announcers always say that that line is an official. How can we tell that these offsides lines that they use are official and 100% accurate. It's coming down to just the thinnest of margins. As we can see from these two decisions and decisions from the past couple of seasons, it's really having a huge impact on how these matches finish. And it's really giving, you know, emboldening defenses and helping take goals away more so than giving goals to offensive teams. So especially in these two cases, I mean, think about it. Liverpool could have won that match versus Everton, would have been a huge three points for them as they're in the title race. Crystal Palace and Leeds. Leeds, newly promoted side, trying to pick up some momentum there. And then, of course, Palace were able to score just a few minutes later. So uh, it's been tough for VAR. I still think it was necessarily needed in the Premier League, but they got to work the kinks out in this handball rule. I think they need to take a look at once again. I don't think that, that any part of that arm should be flagged for offsides, especially when it's something like what Bamford was doing, signaling for where he wanted the ball. For Mane, he was coming back. His arm wasn't even raised. It was just at his side. There's nothing that he can do to think about keeping that on side. So if they fix the handball rule, hopefully that allows for less offsides in terms of, you know, arms and fingers and things like that being called for offsides. So, yeah, this has been a huge problem in the EPL. It helped decide this match. It helped decide the Liverpool match. And it's going to happen at least a couple more times in the season, uh, especially from game to game. Hopefully, though, it doesn't happen in some of these really, really big matches. So, it's unfortunate. It's still a problem in the EPL. I'm hoping that they fix it. I'd like to see them take that language out of the rules, the clear and obvious thing, because obviously they're not doing that. So hopefully moving forward, 
they'll fix the language, they'll fix the rules, and eventually VR will be a welcome addition to the English Premier League. Okay, like I said, it is international break this week, so not much club soccer, at least big club soccer going on, but we just had a huge weekend across the board in Europe with some really big matches. I'd like to break down my top five matches from the past weekend. I want to start out in the EPL at number five, Everton versus Manchester United. United, once again, got off to a slow start. They conceded early to Everton, and Everton obviously going up 1-0. But once again, United's offense kicked into gear and led by a brace from Bruno Fernandes. They were able to pull out the 3-1 victory. Important thing also late on in the match, new signing Edison Cavani, who comes over from PSG, was able to score his first goal for the club. That's a really cool sign for them. We're not sure how much Cavani has left because he's in his mid-30s, but that would be a different element to the United attack, having that big physical central striker to target in the box. Again, Fernandez coming off of a poor match uh, last week against Istanbul. Good to see him get back to his scoring ways and pick up a couple goals. But even with that win, United still sit in 14th place. They've lost a ton of ground already in the EPL. Going to have to try to claw their way back up into the table. Meanwhile, on the other side, Everton have really fallen off. It's been the defense. They just cannot keep teams out of the net right now. Uh, Dominic Calvert-Lewin didn't score here. He's been scoring in every game, basically, for them. So uh, they're going to have to find, find a way to rediscover their form under Carlos Ancelotti if they want to stay near the top of the table. Otherwise, they're going to continue to drift downwards back in the mid-table the way they were. But good developments for the United. We'll see if they can put a few good matches together. Next up, moving over to the German Bundesliga, going to a big-time matchup. A couple of top four teams went at it in a seven-goal thriller. Bayer Leverkusen outlasted Borussia Mönchengladbach 4-3, to three, an exciting up-and-down match. Uh, the home side, Bayer Leverkusen got a couple of goals from Lucas Olerio in the first half before eventually the game-winning goal was scored by Julian Bumgartlinger. However, the highlight of the match was from a Borussia Mönchengladbach player. Valentino Lazaro scored a beautiful scorpion over-the-head kick goal in stoppage time to make it 4-3. to three. you got to go on YouTube and check it out. But, of course, Mucin Gladbach probably would have rather had the three points. Like I said, this was a very fun and fast-paced match with a lot of different goals. And, again, between two top teams right now, you've got Leverkusen, I believe, in the Europa League, and you've got Mucin Gladbach in the Champions League. This was very exciting. And, again, it's an important match by Leverkusen. Kind of keep pace and keep within those top few teams that are just ahead of them, while as Mucin Gladbach dropped a few places in the table. So a couple of fun offensive teams putting on a thriller in the Bundesliga. Can't get much better than that. All right, up next at number three, moving over to Serie A in Italy. There were a couple of big matches in Serie A over the weekend, but this is the one I picked out, Lazio versus Juventus. Felipe Caicedo was able to rescue a point for Lazio, the home side, in stoppage time by scoring the equalizer to make it a 1-1 draw. For Juventus, Cristiano Ronaldo, of course, opened the scoring. This was his second match back after testing positive and recovering from COVID-19. He also hit the post in this match, but he didn't get a lot of help. And Juventus weren't really able to finish off their chances and push for the next goal. And Lazio were able to take advantage. This, of course, sets Juventus back in the table. They're trailing AC Milan right now by a couple of points. And Milan were able to pull out a draw for themselves with Zlatan Ibrahimovic scoring a late equalizer there. So Juventus right now, not firing on all cylinders, but now that they got Ronaldo back, I expect them to get back to the form that they had to start the season. And again, for Lazio, it was their fun team. They're missing several key players, including their leading goal scorer, Sirio Immobile, and they were able to get a draw versus Juventus. An impressive result there. And we'll see as they continue to go forward, both Lazio and Juventus in the Champions League this season. We'll see if they can balance their schedules and we'll see who was able to come out on top in Serie A. Coming in at number two, the biggest EPL match from this past weekend, one that never seems to disappoint, Man City versus Liverpool. A very energetic and fun first half kind of gave way to a sluggish second half. It looked like both teams have really been feeling the pain of all those matches that they've played so far in 2020. Uh, Liverpool were able to open the scoring through a most solid penalty, but that was eventually canceled out by a Gabriel Jesus strike in the box just a few minutes later. Biggest development of that first half was a Kevin De Bruyne cross was impeded by Joe Gomez. Looked like to be an outstretched arm. The referee called for a penalty, but De Bruyne stepped up and he missed it. He drugged it wide and the score remained 1-1. And that's how the match finished off. The biggest developments, I would say, outside just of both teams dropping points here, is Liverpool. They have hit an injury crisis officially. In this match, Trent Alexander-Arnold, their outstanding right back, was taken off the field early. 
He's going to be out for four weeks. Now, of course, the international break helps and gives him some time off, but he's going to miss a couple matches coming up here for Liverpool. He's not only huge on the defensive end for them, but he's one of their best guys at delivering balls into the box from that right side. And he's going to be sorely missed. Then, of course, this week during the international break, we discovered that Joe Gomez had a knee injury in training with England, and he's going to have to have surgery, and he's going to be out for a while. That now makes three key members of Liverpool defense who are out long-term with injury. You've got Virgil van Dijk, Joe Gomez, and Trent Alexander-Arnold. So this has always been my problem with Liverpool. They've never prepared really to deal with some of these injuries. The depth is going to be tested here, especially they're going to have to put some guys in positions that they haven't played before, and they're going to have to find a way to get to the January transfer window and find a way to get a center back and some other defensive reinforcements. So that's the big development going forward, Man City. Obviously, you know, they're still waiting on Sergio Aguero to get back to full fitness. They've got some questions as well on their defense, but they were able to keep Liverpool to just a goal. And again, a draw doesn't help or hurt both teams, really. They're still the two favorites right now in the EPL. But coming in at number one of my top five matches from this past weekend, it's pretty obvious. It's the classicer. It's Borussia Dortmund versus Bayern Munich. Another thrilling match between these two, but again, another match where Bayern were able to come out on top versus Dortmund. The biggest development to start the match was Bayern Munich's Joshua Kimmich having to come off early due to injury, and we found out that he's going to be out long-term. He's going to be out until January. That's a big blow for Bayern. He's one of their top young stars, and he joins Alfonso Davies on the sidelines. Lucy Dortmund actually opened the scoring through Marco Royce. Nice side-footed effort inside the box, and we're leading 1-0 up close to halftime. But a stunning free-kick routine highlighted by David Alaba's strike tied the match there for Bayern Munich. In the second half, early on, Robert Lewandowski, that man again, was able to get his head onto a ball and get Bayern Munich the lead. Later on, Leroy Sané, a substitute, was able to come in and get a goal on the counterattack. Erling Haaland made it 3-2, and Dortmund had chances late to tie the match, including Marco Royce, I mean, from basically point-blank range, skying an effort over the bar. And that's been the story, really, for Dortmund over these past few matches with Bayern. They've had plenty of chances to take the lead or to extend leads or to get back in these matches, and they just can't seem to put away goals in those crucial moments. And, of course, on the defensive end, they can't seem to keep Bayern out. Even with the loss of Kimmich early on, Bayern were able to overcome that and to get crucial goals from their main men. Uh, still, really thrilling game. Bayern right now only a couple points ahead of Dortmund with that separation. We'll see how the rest of the season goes. There will obviously be one more matchup between these two that Dortmund are going to have to have if they want that Bundesliga title. But this is, once again, another thrilling match with a lot of great young talent. Very excited for these teams, not just now, but for the future. And we'll have to see how the rest of the season plays out. So those were my top five club soccer matches from the past weekend. Now I want to move into the main part of this week, which is the international break and the international fixture schedule. And, of course, we have to start in Europe. We have to start with the most important matches of them all, which will be the final four European Championship qualifying spots. We had those playoffs way back in March. And of course, there were several postponements along the way. We had the Euros postponed. Finally, the semifinals had been played in October. And these were the final matchups for the final four spots between eight teams. We're going to start with Georgia versus North Macedonia, a couple of real heavyweights going against each other. Of course, this is an exciting opportunity. Both teams were trying to qualify for the Euros for the first time in their history. And it was North Macedonia who were able to come out on top and qualify for their first ever major tournament by defeating Georgia 1-0 on the road. 37-year-old Goran Pandev, the country's all-time leading goal scorer, was the guy to gift North Macedonia this victory. He scored in the 56th minute in a match that had 29 fouls. It was a real brutal match between these two sides. Not the you know, most gifted technically-wise or skill-wise, but still a great moment for North Macedonia to qualify for their first ever major tournament. And really cool was is that they qualified really through the Nations League. They qualified through League D, and again, an excellent opportunity to showcase some new sides at this tournament. Interesting to see what they can bring to the table. So that was probably the least flashy or the least exciting match of the four. These other three were some real barn burners. We're going to start with Hungary versus Iceland. Everybody knows Iceland from the World Cup and from the last Euros, and it looked like they were headed back to the Euros after they took the lead early from a Gilfie Sigurdsson free kick. But Hungary... They kept up the pace. They were really pounding Iceland's goal with a lot of shots. And then late on in the match, they were able to find the equalizer. And even more so, they found the match winner. 
Hungary picked up the equalizer in the 80th minute before Dominic Zajvasloy, a really young, exciting player that is now being linked to Real Madrid of all places, was able to score the winner off a beautiful individual run and an excellent strike to send Hungary to the European Championships. The bad news for Hungary? They go into the group of death. France, Germany, Portugal. Definitely going to be an extremely tough test to qualify out of that group. But the cool thing is, two of those matches in group play will be played in Budapest, so at Hungary's national team home stadium. So an excellent opportunity there for Hungary to potentially play in front of their home crowd, but still really cool that they get to be in the Euros. They'll play these top teams and get some experience there. So excellent comeback by Hungary to see off Iceland. Next up, we've got Northern Ireland hosting Slovakia. And much like the previous match, an early goal was canceled out by a late equalizer. This time it was Slovakia who opened the scoring, but actually it was an own goal by Milan Skriniar, the center back for Slovakia, put it into his own net. So the match went into extra time. And there, Michael Duras was able to beat the Northern Ireland goalkeeper to his near post to take a 2-1 lead. And Slovakia were able to hold on there. So again, impressive effort in extra time to come away with the victory for Slovakia and to advance towards the European Championships. And lastly, what was probably the most high-profile matchup of the four, Serbia hosting Scotland. And I can finally say, for you long-suffering Scottish fans, the wait is finally over. For the first time since 1996, Scotland qualified for the Euros, and they did it in thrilling fashion in a penalty kick shootout, beating Serbia 5-4 on penalties after the match ended 1-1 in normal time. Scotland almost pulled it out in normal time before Real Madrid's Luka Jovic was able to score in the 90th minute. Having just beat Israel on pens in the previous round in the semifinals, Scotland made all five of their shots, while on the final shot for Serbia, goalkeeper David Marshall was able to keep out Alexander Mitrovic's penalty shot. They had to go VAR to see if he kept his foot on the line. He did, and that's how Scotland advanced to the Euros. Scotland now goes into a Euro Championships group that includes longtime rivals England. It's going to be really cool to see Scotland versus England once again at a major tournament. So happy for Scottish fans. It's been a long time suffering. Of course, they're still trying to qualify for the World Cup once again, but this is a nice consolation prize. They've got a lot of great up-and-coming talent there, and they're able to grind out a couple victories in the semifinals and finals on penalty kicks to get to the European Championships. So congrats to North Macedonia, to Hungary, to Slovakia, and to Scotland on being the final four teams to qualify for next summer's European Championships. So those matches all took place yesterday. Now I want to get to some of the matches that will be happening over this weekend and into next week. I'm, of course, talking about the UEFA Nations League. That gets back underway here this weekend and, of course, has some really great matchups to potentially look ahead, not just here in the Nations League, but to look forward towards in the Euros and beyond. So I want to start out with some matches to look forward to on Saturday. You've got Portugal versus France. This is a rematch, of course, of the last European Championship final. You'll have Cristiano Ronaldo versus Kylian Mbappe, potentially. All of that great young talent on the French side. While for Portugal, we're starting to see a couple of guys over the past couple of seasons, like Bernardo Silva, and now Diego Jota at Liverpool, really come into their own and kind of build a complete team around Cristiano Ronaldo. So again, great matchup of two sides two sides that will meet at next summer's European Championships but are going to meet here on Saturday in the Nations League. Also on Saturday, looking forward to Switzerland versus Spain. Switzerland, really balanced side, really emphasized defense, whereas with Spain, we're finally starting to see that transition from the old guard, you know, your Sergio Ramoses, your Gerard Piquets, some of the older attacking players with this young group. We've also seen some guys like Alvaro Morata, really get into form and potentially play their way into a spot for next summer. So I'm going to want to continue to see Spain's transition and how they use their younger players going up against a well-balanced side in Switzerland. On Sunday, another big rematch between two really big teams in Europe. That would be Belgium versus England. Again, the dynamic is so cool. So many Belgian players right now play in the EPL, the best of Belgium's team. They'll be going up against guys they've seen from week in and week out. With England, we're starting to see a couple injuries, obviously, especially with the Liverpool defenders being out. How will they be able to handle that? You've got Harry Kane, who's on some quite form right now for both England and for Tottenham. So I'll be interested to see how he plays with some of these English national team stars. And for Belgium, of course, using that group, using the golden generation, De Bruyne, Aiden Hazard, now that he's healthy, how will they look going up against England? Also on Sunday, you've got Italy versus Poland. That's going to be a defensive slugfest, I believe. But 
Italy, much like Spain, are making the transition to some of their more younger talent. We saw it this week in the friendly where they were able to put uh, four goals on their end. And again, against Poland, who are well-balanced side, we'll see if Robert Lewandowski is playing up top for them as well. But they've got a couple of great strikers there already in Milik and Picek. So it could be a high-scoring match, but I anticipate a low-scoring match because both those teams are excellent defensively. Looking ahead to Tuesday, I've got France versus Sweden on my list. Again, any chance you get to see the defending World Cup champions, I think you got to check them out and see the, just the full group of players that they have. Going up against Sweden, who have moved away from Zlatan Ibrahimovic and have found some new stars and a new way to bring about to build around their team. So we'll see how France looks against them. But of course, the big match on Tuesday, Spain versus Germany. Again, two of the best teams from this past decade. Both are making transition to young talent. We've seen with Germany with Timo Werner and Kai Havertz making the move to Chelsea. They're also experimenting with a new back line there as well. So two heavyweights going against each other should be a relatively high scoring match and something to look forward to, to potentially seeing in the Euros next summer. And rounding out the schedule on Wednesday, you've got England versus Iceland. Again, another fun matchup of a rematch between those two sides, the famous one where Iceland were able to beat England. We'll see how those two teams match up against each other. And also, Poland, I got Poland on here once again, but it's more so their opponent, the Netherlands. I'd like to see them without Virgil van Dijk, how that defense looks, and who they're choosing to go play up top. I know Memphis Depay of Lyon has been in some fine form, but I want to see who can join them up there and kind of complete that attack for the Netherlands. And of course, Frank de Boer coming off of a horrible campaign with the Lane United where he was let go. How does he continue to evolve this Dutch side and make it better and continue to bring them back to prominence. So Poland, again, still a nice side to see, but interested to check in on the Netherlands on Wednesday and see how they look. So those are some of the more interesting matchups from this weekend in the Nations League, all four leagues getting back underway. And again, this has potential Euro implications for the next round, I believe, because everything's backed up. I think they're playing for the next Euros, but still, you have an opportunity to move your way up if you're in one of the lower leagues and really make an impact and try to qualify for the major tournament. So. Again, even if some of these matches are glorified friendlies, it's still cool to see these big matchups between these teams and look forward to potential matchups at the Euros. Now I want to transition over to South America, where there's actually some FIFA World Cup qualifying going on as we speak. Common Bowl in South America have already gone through one round of qualifying matches. This will be the second round this international break. Brazil is currently at the top of the table right now. They've already scored nine goals in two matches again. They are the kings of South America still, and the offense looks spectacular, even with Neymar being out. Right behind them, Argentina, again with Lionel Messi and all the talent that they have there. Right behind them, we've got Colombia, Paraguay, and Ecuador rounding out those final spots for qualification as of right now. The surprises, I guess, that aren't involved currently would be Uruguay and Chile, a couple of sides that we've seen at these past World Cups do quite well. So a couple matchups to look forward to. Friday afternoon, you've got Colombia versus Uruguay. Colombia has been a really exciting team these past few years. You obviously have Jaimes Rodriguez, but they've really been able to develop a lot of cool talent, and it now seems as though they have a great striker to target up top. Duvan Zapata has had a great couple last seasons with Atalanta and Serie A. He's been scoring goals at an incredible rate, and he really brings a new dynamic to that Colombian attack with Rodriguez. So excited to see those guys in action against Uruguay. Then Uruguay have another tough matchup on Tuesday when they take on Brazil. And Neymar obviously will be out. We'll see how Brazil looks without him. And again, with Uruguay making the transition away from some of their older stars, how are they able to use their younger guys to try to pick up some points and get back into qualifying for the World Cup? Interesting note, also a couple of LAFC guys, Brian Rodriguez and Diego Rossi, I believe were called into the Uruguay national team. Excited to see those guys potentially get some minutes and see if they can have an impact for Uruguay in World Cup qualifying. So again, big implications for the World Cup going on right now. Nobody else is really doing World Cup qualifying. South America is getting a head start. And as usual, Brazil and Argentina are at the top at the moment, but anything can happen. So we'll see how the table looks after this next round of qualifying matches. Real quickly, before I move on to my Soccer in America section, I do want to say I'll have a more in-depth breakdown of both of the U.S. men's national teams friendlies versus Wales and versus Panama. On next week's show, I'll also be talking about Mexico because they've got a couple of interesting friendlies versus South Korea and Japan during this international break. So we're going to break down both sides 
how they look here in their initial action back after long layoffs, and especially with the U.S. men's national team, how this young group of players looks in these two friendlies. So again, more extensive breakdown of the U.S. men's national team in Mexico coming on next week's show. Now it's time to transition to soccer in America, and we're going to start with the conclusion of the MLS regular season. We have our playoff teams in each of the two conferences, and we have our schedule starting with the Eastern Conference play and matches. Those are set to take place to kick off the tournament on November 20th. So here are the sides from both conferences who have qualified for the playoffs. Let's start with the Eastern Conference team, starting with the Supporters Shield winners, the Philadelphia Union, who were led by a great group of young players highlighted by Brendan Aronson and Mark McKenzie, who was nominated for Defender of the Year. Uh, they're still waiting on the results for Andre Blake, their stud goalkeeper who's got a hand injury, but it sounds like he's going to recover in time to be a factor in the playoffs. Right behind Philly, you've got Toronto FC, once again, riding that great group of veteran talent. And of course, the breakout year of Ayo Akinola, their star 20-year-old striker. We'll have to see if they can use their pedigree and experience to once again make it to the final. Coming in at number three, you've got Columbus Crew SC, being led by the likes of Darlington Nagby there in that midfield. Number four, Orlando City SC, led by Nani, and coming off that great MLS's back tournament form, and they were able to qualify here for the playoffs at the number four seed. Next up, you've got the New York teams coming at five and six. First, New York City FC, followed by New York Red Bulls. Then you get to the play-in teams. Nashville SC coming in as the seventh seed, making the playoffs in their first season in existence. They are followed by the New England Revolution at number eight, Montreal Impact at number nine, and just squeaking in at number 10, Enter Miami CF, the other expansion side, making the playoffs in their first season. So a couple of those first round play-in matchups, you've got Nashville versus Inter Miami, the two expansion sides battling it out to see who can advance out of the play-in round. And of course, you've got Montreal and the Revolution. As far as the favorites in that conference, obviously Philly with all of their young talent, the defensive backbone that they have are going to be favored. you got to like Toronto's pedigree as well. And I think coming off that MLS's back success, maybe a team like Orlando can find the magic once again and find a way to navigate through this group. And of course, also the two New York teams have some really great offensive firepower as well. Could be some upsets there at the bottom of that table. So good to see the expansion sides get in. Good to see some firepower at the top of this conference. Should be a really great race in the East. Now moving over to the Western Conference and what is a really loaded top of the conference, starting with the number one overall seed, Sporting KC, once again, having a great season. You still got the likes of Graham Zussi and Matt Beisler there, the veterans at the back, but they were led by star striker Alan Polito, who was a brand new addition to the club this season, and he did a great job scoring goals and getting them here to this overall number one seed. Right behind them, the reigning champs, Seattle Sounders, once again, Another great offensive season. They got MVP-type performances from Jordan Morris and Raul Ruiz Diaz and Nicholas Ladero. That fantastic front three. They've got Stefan Fry still in, in goal and will be one of the favorites once again to make it towards the MLS Cup. Right behind Saddle are the rivals, the Portland Timbers, led by Diego Valeri and Sebastian Blanco in the midfield once again. Of course, they were the winners of the MLS's back tournament, so we'll see if they can continue that magical run into the playoffs. Next up, Minnesota United FC, led by their star midfielder, Kevin Molino. Right behind them are the Colorado Rapids, who were able to get through their season. They had a really tough time with COVID, had a lot of matches canceled, but they were able to get it done and find a way into the playoffs. Right behind them are FC Dallas, who despite losing players such as Reggie Cannon, found a way to get into the playoffs. Next up, LAFC. Tough time with Carlos Vela and a couple other guys who had some key injuries, but too much offensive firepower, of course, with the Golden Boot winner, Diego Rossi, the acquisition of Bradley Wright Phillips. So still too much offensive talent for them to miss out on the playoffs, but definitely a more disappointing season than they were expecting. And then lastly, in the West, you've got the San Jose Earthquakes, who were able to get in on one of the last couple games of the season. So loaded Western Conference, they don't have the playing matches like the East because the East has more teams. And of course, the big first round matchup to look at are the Seattle Sounders versus LAFC. Another rematch, this time from last season's, I believe, Western Conference Final. Two of the best offensive teams in the league. I don't care about LAFC's standing or their record. They got some of the best talent in the league. Surely will be another high-scoring match. But again, it's going to come down to defense on LAFC's part. That's what's been their struggle for the past few seasons. Can they find a way to keep Seattle out of the net enough so that their offense can score enough goals to win this match? 
Uh, going to be really exciting to see that so early in the first round. You've got teams like Sporting KC in Portland who are incredibly well balanced and will be a nice, you know, test for teams like Seattle to try to go up against. And they're in the middle. Somebody like Minnesota could really pull off an upset. They've had to grind out a lot of different victories. They've had a lot of late finishes in their season. Could be an underdog pick here to come out of the Western Conference. However, Something that is overshadowing the first round or so of these MLS playoffs is the international break and certain players being called by their international sides to come play for them. Due to COVID-19 protocols, once players come back from their international service, they have to be quarantined for a certain amount of days. And with that quarantine period, it will not allow for certain players for when they come back to participate in their MLS club's first playoff matches. Guys like Rodolfo Pizarro of Inner Miami. You've got Randall Leal of Nashville SC. Jan Gregus of Minnesota United. And then the big one, the golden boot winner, like to talk about, Diego Rossi being called in by Uruguay from LAFC. They could miss their club's first round playoff matchups because of the COVID-19 protocols. So it gets back to, again, MLS not really formulating their schedule to fit with the international break. It's going to have a huge impact on these first round matchups between these teams who are missing some of their key players. So in terms of the results, we could get a couple really weird ones here in the first round because certain guys are missing from their clubs. Hopefully this is something that MLS can fix and build upon next season and maybe in the future can start to tailor or put in a break period or push the playoffs back so that an international break does not get in the way of seeing the best players on these teams playing for these clubs. But still going to be an exciting tournament. Looking forward to seeing both conferences, how they play out, and who's going to make it to that December MLS Cup final. Next up, we're going to move to the NWSL. Obviously, the big story coming from that league was the expansion draft. Racing Louisville FC announced their expansion picks on Twitch on Thursday night, and I want to go through some of the bigger acquisitions with you all. Of course, the headline has to be the acquisitions of the player rights to Tobin Heath and Christian Press. They were the last two picks by Louisville. Of course, right now, Press and Heath are over in England playing for Manchester United. We're not sure if they will want to come back and play for Louisville, but still, these are big accusations for Louisville just in case that they can use them as trade bait and potentially pick up allocation money to use on other players as well. But in an ideal scenario, it would be kind of cool to see Press and Heath come back to the U.S. and play in this expansion side's first season. So those were the headline picks, but... Louisville were really able to pick up some high value additions. It was the obvious theme of the club to target younger players. And you could definitely see that within the first few picks. Louisville's first pick was spent on NC Courage fullback Addison Merrick, who was coming off of a great rookie season with the NC Courage. She was really looked at as someone who could help fill the void left by Crystal Dunn and by Jalen Daniels. Now it's another blow to the NC Courage back line. And Merrick is going to be a great addition to Louisville. She's very versatile there at the back and will provide instant help for that club. Just to highlight a few other picks by Louisville, Jennifer Cujo of Sky Blue FC is a great young midfielder coming off a good season for that club and someone who can provide a lot of energy and a lot of help there in the center of the midfield. Another upside pick, former Houston Dash forward CC Kaiser, who played a lot of minutes for Houston during their Challenge Cup run and also into the fall series. Again, Another young forward, she's coming off of her rookie season and hopefully someone that Louisville can be able to develop into a top scorer in the NWSL. Lastly, I want to highlight OL Reign goalkeeper Michelle Betos. She was hampered by injuries this past season, but she was the top NWSL goalkeeper, goalkeeper of the year in 2015. So if she can rediscover her form, if she can get healthy, she can be a rock at the back there for Louisville. So Louisville were able to pick up some veterans. They were able to pick up some stars potentially. At least they have the rights to these stars. And of course, the big thing, they were able to pick up some young players who they hope can continue to blossom and can continue to develop under their watch and be longstanding members of this new club. So hats off to Louisville. Congrats. You've got players now. You've got a coach. You are now in the NWSL. Of course, now going forward, the trade window has opened for the league uh, on Friday, and we'll have to see if there will be more deals to be had in the coming days. But very exciting time right now for the NWSL to bring in a new club into the fold. And lastly, I want to pivot to the USL Championship and talk a little bit about some news and notes from that league. I'm going to start off with the MVP award and who got it. That would be Phoenix Rising FC's Solomon Asante. He was named the USL Championship MVP 
for the second year in a row. Asante, of course, led that great Phoenix Rising attack, and he finished the year with six goals and a league-leading nine assists. He's a fantastic playmaker. Again, the engine that really drives that Phoenix Rising FC team. Of course, didn't get to see him in the USL Championship Final due to that cancellation due to COVID-19, but still excellent season once again by Asante. Next up, I want to talk about some more sad news. Of course, St. Louis FC fans will be able to relate to this, but it was announced after finishing with the best regular season record in the USL Championship. Reno 1868 FC announced that they'd be ceasing operations after this season. Again, really disappointing to see this from one of the top leagues here in the U.S. And after such a great historic season from Reno, that they have to do this. In the fourth season in the USL, Reno made the playoffs each year, and they finished with an overall record of 62, 26, and 28. So, again, very disappointed for those fans, but still, they had great success in their time in the USL. Making the playoffs every year is a huge accomplishment, especially in the Western Conference. So, very sad to see Reno go, and hoping that players and staff from there will be able to find new jobs on different teams. And lastly, we move from that situation to one of the more stable situations in the entire league. I'm, of course, talking about Louisville City FC. They announced this past week that they will be retaining the services of several players that helped lead them to the Eastern Conference Final. The likes of Paulo DePiccolo, Corbin Bone, Brian Ownby, Oscar Jimenez, and Antoine Hoppeno will be returning next year for the 2021 season for Louisville City FC. Again, they've been the picture of stability in this league, which has had a large part to do with their success, they'll be looking to make their seventh straight Eastern Conference final next season. So hats off to them and their organization and what they're doing. Of course, they've got the women's team now getting going in the NWSL. It's a good time to be a Louisville fan. Obviously, there'll be some players still that they want to bring back, but that is a huge first step to retaining the services of a lot of different players in terms of staying at the top of the Eastern Conference. All right, so that's what's going on in soccer in America. Now let's transition to what's happening here in St. Louis. Of course, we have to start with the big news and with St. Louis City SC. It was announced on Thursday by the new MLS club that they had brought in three more additions to their front office staff. St. Louis City SC announced the hirings of Tim Twelman, Charles Rankin, and Elvir Kovacic as sporting community relations consultants. The really cool thing about these three hires is that they all have youth academy coaching experience and ties to St. Louis. All three have played at the professional level. Rankin and Kavicic have played here in St. Louis professionally as well. But I think the really cool part about these hires is they all three come from diverse backgrounds. They're all going to have connections to different communities here in St. Louis. And again, all of them have been in soccer, have continued to be in soccer after their playing careers, especially at the youth academy level, which is really what they're being brought in to do. The main job that they will be tasked to do is they're going to assist sporting director Lutz Fennenschiel in helping build a youth academy here for City SC and to scout for on-field talent. It's going to be entirely St. Louis based and no better way to do that with three guys with St. Louis ties. So again, I think the big parts are the experience factor, the connections factor, and that they all three come from diverse backgrounds, but they all three have St. Louis ties. So Really cool hires by City. I know they're going to continue to fill out that front office staff, and we'll have to see who will be the next addition to the new club. Moving on to a little bit of St. Louis FC news. Just wanted to update people about the awards process for the USL. Both Joaquin Rivas and Kyle Morton fell short with their nominations for USL championship goal and save of the playoffs, respectfully. Both were nominated for their crucial plays in the club's 1-0 victory versus Hartford Athletic in the playoffs, the club's first ever playoff victory, but they both fell just short in the fan voting, but still tremendous accomplishments for them, tremendous memories for fans and for the club, something that can't be taken away from anybody. So hats off to Morton and for Rivas for their award nominations. Next up, want to highlight an accomplishment from a St. Louis FC Academy alum and the current goalkeeper at St. Louis University, and that would be one Patrick Schulte. Schulte was invited to the 2020 College Invitational Combine in Kansas City. This weekend, it's kind of replacing the MLS Combine, it's going to be for seniors and for specific underclassmen, which Schulte qualifies for. Staff and scouts from over 40 MLS and USL clubs will be there, so it's going to be a great showcase for these college players. Schulte will be joined by teammate senior Patrick Wilkinson also at this tournament, but still, great news for the former St. Louis FC Academy alum to be able to showcase himself early on in his college career and really hopefully turn some heads 
at this combine. So great for him, great for Wilkinson to showcase themselves. Good luck to those guys here in Kansas City this weekend. Next up, I want to talk about some professional soccer that will be returning to St. Louis here in the new future, and that would be the St. Louis Ambush. The Ambush will return to action in December as part of a four-team preseason Central Cup tournament. Joining the Ambush are the Dallas Sidekicks, the Wichita Wings, and rivals Kansas City Comets. Matches will be played in Allen, Texas, Park City, Kansas, and St. Charles, Missouri, with each team playing the other teams just once. The tournament kicks off December 12th, and ticket information will be coming out in the following weeks. Good to see that the ambush will be coming back. I always enjoyed uh, going to steamers matches when I was a kid. Indoor soccer is a fun way to get into the game. And for the ambush, it's a great way to get back into the swing of things. I know that their upcoming season has been kind of upheaved because of the pandemic, but this will be a great way to get back into it and interested to see the new signings that they've brought in and to see how they could potentially look for the upcoming season. So Ticket information, hopefully some fans will get to be in attendance. We'll have to see. But still, great developments here in St. Louis to have the ambush coming back in this next upcoming month. And lastly, to round out the show, I had a great conversation with someone who is the head of one of the most important soccer institutions in the city, who has been a big part of the city's soccer culture for quite some time. I hope you all will enjoy. Let's take a look. Well, I'm honored to be joined with today by someone who is the head of one of the most influential, important institutions, soccer institutions here in St. Louis, a man who had a distinguished playing career here in STL has now had a long tenure as the president of the St. Louis Soccer Hall of Fame. Mr. Jim Leaker, thank you so much for joining me today. Yeah, perfectly all right, Josh. Glad to, glad to talk about the Hall of Fame. Well, exactly. I want to get back in touch with you and talk to you about the Hall of Fame because it was going to be just last week that the original date for the 2020 Hall of Fame class induction and banquet that was going to happen last week, but because of the pandemic, you guys had postponed the induction ceremony to May of 2021. So considering that it was gonna be last week, I just wanna to talk to you a little bit about going back through that process of having to make that decision. What was that like the decision that had to be made and how you guys were able to come up with that and postpone the induction and ceremony to next year? Well, in, in, in actuality, it was an easy decision because of the attendees that come to our, our banquet are, I hate to say this, but they're a little bit older than the, the normal banquet crew, uh, group. Um, and we just couldn't, we could not have a banquet without those people. And we didn't want to even fathom the idea of bringing them to a banquet and having them, you know, sit amongst people who, who knows what might have, have happened. Um, the Union Station has been more than gracious with trying to help us out. Um, we have it rescheduled, but um, as of right now, we're contemplating even canceling the, the May date. We'll, we'll finalize that probably in the next couple of weeks. But so I'll, I'll keep everybody up to date once we decide what, what, the, what the outcome is going to be for the May date. Um, naturally, if we don't have uh, something soon, the class of 2020 will still be this class of 2020. Uh, we decided not to have any Jimmy Johnson Award, uh, the Monsignor Meyer Team Award, the Future Stars, any of the major awards that we normally give out. In addition to the inductees, we're not going to even even go that route. So all we're going to do is honor just the class. So it's sad that we had to do it, but it, it, it was the right decision. It's a tough call because you want to give each and every class the same opportunity to be honored and to have, go through that process and have people there to honor them. This 2020 class is stacked once again. I mean, you guys always oh. have great classes, but just to highlight a few of the names, at least that stuck out to me, I can remember when you showed up to uh, St. Louis FC practice one day to announce that Steve Trishu was going to be part of this class. A guy I've watched for an MLS, you know, a few years ago, Brad Davis being a part of this class. And of course, some of the other older guys that are part of the legendary soccer culture that we have in STL. I just want to go back a little bit with the 2020 class, some of the other guys that stand out to you. Every one of them has, has a stellar career. Uh, naturally, Brad Davis with St. Louis U, the national team and MLS uh, background. Chris Kenny, St. Louis U and the, and the uh, St. Louis Steamers. Uh, Jim Walshmitt with Indiana University. Uh, a gentleman by the name of Al Fink who was part of the original CUDIS um, 
lineup of the 50s, um, he's being inducted. And, you know, that's, that's something that probably should have been done a long time ago. Uh, Kevin Egan with the Tulsa Roughnecks uh, from North St. Louis. Um, Mark Darcy with UMSL, just a great guy. Steve Kuntz from St. Louis U in the St. Louis Ambush. Uh, Ted Powers uh, finished his career at college career at Rockers with Tony Toko uh, and came back to play with uh, the uh, Ambush for a couple of years. Jim Tejans, what a great guy this gentleman is. He's gone through, I'm not sure how many heart operations or I think he might have even had a kidney, you know, removed. I, you know, he has gone through so much in his life uh, as a young man, but uh, what a great guy. He uh, played at St. Louis U, uh, then he went to uh, the Florida Strikers. Um, naturally, Steve Tristew, who can, who, who can, who can not honor a gentleman as part of the national team. Um, and then the last one, this gentleman, he probably should have been inducted uh, in the original class of 2000 or 1971. His name is Jim Cahill. And if you're familiar with Dave Lang's book, he has been known as the father of American soccer. Uh, he was born here in St. Louis, ended up moving out to the, out to the West Coast, but he routinely came back to St. Louis to give his you know, give his support to St. Louis soccer. Uh, Jim Cahill should have been inducted a long time ago. And, and oddly enough, there's one other fellow who we're going to probably lobby for his induction, who was part of the original Sticks, Bear, and Fuller team. His name is Alec McNabb. Alec was part of the original Sticks, Bear, and Fuller team. He came from the East Coast. There was two people that came from the East Coast, Werner Nielsen, and Alec McNabb, along with other, other gentlemen to play soccer in St. Louis. Werner was inducted into the St. Louis Soccer Hall of Fame already. For some reason or another, uh, these two gentlemen stayed, coached, continued to play, coached, and then ended up you know, dying here in St. Louis and they're both buried here in St. Louis. And so um, I think it's only fitting that Alec McNabb be a, a part of one of the upcoming classes. Um, so. So I wanted to know a little bit about the behind the scenes process to this, because again, it's, it's a tough decision every year with the amount of guys and the amount of history that this city has when it comes to soccer, to go through this process, uh, to be eligible for the hall of fame and then to make these tough choices. Just want to a little bit, know a little bit more about the process, how you guys come sure. to these decisions, who all is involved. Yeah. Well, we accept applications from, from all, all individuals, male and female. Um, those who have played indoor and outdoor. When I first became associated with the Hall of Fame, that was one of the, the key areas that I tried to convince the uh, original committee to consider women and to consider um, the indoor game. They, they strictly wanted it to be outdoor game and men only. But uh, we've been able to make those changes pretty, pretty easily. Uh, one one major change that we had at, at one time you had to be at least 50 years of age to even apply, and um, we changed that just recently. I would say within the last five years, so that anybody who has, has announced their retirement from sanctioned play, such as Brad Davis, um, can immediately apply. And, and I'll go back to even even uh, Lori Klopney. You know, once she announced that she was retiring, you know, from sanctioned play, uh, we immediately put together an application. Um, at one time, we would hand an application to a gentleman and say, or a gentleman or a lady and say, here, tell me about yourself. Well, those days are gone. We've tried to see who, who has not been inducted in the Hall of Fame. That should be. Um, naturally, the national players come to come to light um and that's when we you know steve trishu was in in town uh a couple of years ago to play the st louis fc and i i said steve i'm going to put together some information check it see if it looks okay sign it and send it back to me i just want to make sure that you want to be a part of the st louis soccer hall of fame you know so that, that's kind of like the process 
once we receive it back, it's dated. And that date is very important because it falls into a category of on our ballot each year, we have 20 people. And you need 51% for induction. So there's going to be a time that we don't induct everybody. So there's everybody's on the ballot for at least five years. After the fifth year, they, uh, if a person has not been inducted, they go to the Veterans Committee. And we try and induct 10. If we don't get 10 in the original, out of the original 51% on the 20, uh, then we'll go to the, go to the veterans, veterans list that, of people who have shown that they are, are good players, but just because of the, the five years that they were part of the program, you find yourself up against a Brad Davis, a Steve Trichu, or a Lori Kalupney, you know, people who, are, who, who we know that the committee is going to vote for, you know, on the first ballot. I'd have to look at my records. I think Lori naturally got 100%, and I believe Steve Trichu got 100%, and Brad Davis. I, you know, there's, there's no doubt, you know. These, these are people who, are, who should be a part of our Hall of Fame. So, again, you guys have been able to do this year after year come out with big classes and put people on a uh, pedestal, rightfully so, and induct them into this Hall of Fame. And now you've gotten to the point where it's going to be the 50th anniversary of the Hall of Fame. Uh, you've been inducted. You've been a part of it in different areas. And, of course, now your long tenure as the president of it. What does that milestone mean to you that you guys have been able to put this together for this long and to have it grow and grow year in, year out? Well, yeah. Uh, uh, when you say grow and grow, what my main interest is, is to keep those teams that made St. Louis such a, such a, a viable city for soccer uh, with the Sticks, Bear, and Fuller team, the Kudus team, uh, the 1950 World Cup team. You know, these are the people who, St. Louis University, these are the teams that put soccer on the map or St. Louis on the map for soccer and we need to keep those memories alive. You know, I've, I've been going out to watch high school games and you know, I, I almost feel like I'd walk up, I, I could, I'd like to walk up to every one of those high school players and say, do you know who Gary Keough is? Do you know who Frank Borgi is? Do you know who Gino Periani is? And um, I don't know if they would know the answer. You know, I've, I've almost, you know, in the back of my mind, I thought of one time putting together um, a program and going out to the clubs and, you know, having, having a, a, a club meeting and introduce myself and tell, tell the kids about St. Louis soccer and the history. Um, I was out at a game not too long ago and there, there was a Kudus player and I said, uh, young boy. And I said, do you know what that CUDA shield stands for? And he says, mm, no, not really. And I go, well, I, I kind of appreciate that. I said, do you know that that CUDA emblem represented the United States in a World Cup match at one time? And he goes, no, you know, it was just kind of like, he, he didn't know that he was part of that type of history. And I think it's, I think it's important that these kids know. And that's what my job is, is to keep that memory of those teams alive. Well, yeah. yeah, it's a big part of our city, obviously. I mean, we pride ourselves on our culture and our history. That's really what has led yeah. to us getting this MLS team. So I do think it's an important part. And again, you guys continue to grow and grow. And again, you guys are bringing in different classes from different eras, which I think is a great, a great help to what you're trying to do there. But I do want to get back to, I want to get you out of here on this, looking ahead. And again, continuing to grow, but with the pandemic, how that has affected your plans. You've talked a little bit about how with 2021, that class and the 2020 class, things are going to get sandwiched together a little bit. I guess what, for people who are expecting news, you said in a couple of weeks, you'll hear about the 2020 class, but how does this affect things going forward for you guys thinking ahead to 2021 and for future classes? Well, naturally the, the, the era of the thousand people coming to our hall of fame banquet is, is going to be over. Uh, Getting back to the class of 2020, the the last thing that we actually thought about doing is having a, a an intimate induction ceremony so we can you know present the inductees with their rings and their jackets and their plaques 
um, so so they can receive this. And we thought about doing it at, at a mass. And um, naturally, it would be you know socially social distancing the whole nine yards, but it would be limited to just the families themselves. You know they're not getting the the, the recognition like you said earlier that to to be honored in front of the, uh, their fans. But I think that it's important to to honor these classes as, as they appear. Uh, as I said, there'll probably be no class of 2021. The class of 2022, uh, we are planning on moving the induction date for the banquet. Hopefully, if we get get back into that scheme of things, we're going to be moving it into the earlier part of the year, somewhere around in March. And it would coincide with the opening of the St. Louis City Games. So especially if we stay downtown at Union Station, um, it'll be a natural fit to be a part of the opening day ceremonies along with our Hall of Fame banquet. Well, I know it's a lot of work and I know it's not exactly the perfect situation for you guys, but I know people are excited still to see the Hall of Fame continue to grow and continue to learn more about the history and the culture here in St. Louis. Jim, for those people who want to learn more about the Hall of Fame, and want to hear about these upcoming announcements, where's the best place for them to go? Well, uh, we have a St. Louis Soccer Hall of Fame website, which is, is pretty intense. Uh, we, we're, naturally, I, I've, been, I've been having a, uh, a good time working on it during this time. Um, there's 900, uh, when we induct this class of 2020, there'll be uh, 950 gentlemen and ladies who would have been inducted into the St. Louis Soccer Hall of Fame over the 50 years. Um, so they can go to the website and see what the history of the St. Louis Soccer Hall of Fame is all about. Uh, most of our immediate messages go over our Facebook page and that's St. Louis Soccer Hall of Fame, you know, Facebook. That's where most of our, our, our information is, is really sent out. We feel very proud to, to have the, the website because out of the 950 people that have been inducted, we probably have 850 people with the, at least a, a, a newspaper article to show their profile. We, we're having a hard time finding pictures because a lot of these people were inducted posthumously and early years of you know, news reporting, they really didn't take team pictures or action pictures in, in the newspaper. So we find, we find their names in print versus a picture so we have about 100 people that we're still trying to locate so it's 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 a it's a you know labor of love put it that way well it's definitely something for people to get into and i encourage people to check that out to not just learn more about the history of the hall of fame but again to keep up with all the upcoming dates and announcements uh, jim looking forward to hopefully when you guys get back under normal operations and can honor uh these men and women in these classes and uh, continue the great work that you guys are doing thank you again for joining me today. Thanks, Josh, and good luck. My thanks to Jim Leaker for joining me on the show. That'll do it for this episode of the Gateway to Soccer Show. Thank you so much for tuning in. As always, don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe to my YouTube channel. I hope everybody enjoys this international break, and I'll be right back here next week with another episode and more soccer talk for you all. Thanks again.